First, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, many of you traveled quite a distance, left your homes, got on planes, etc., to come here on a Saturday to uh, join us in this kind of unique symposium that we have today, where we are doing a deep, deep dive into the aging Fontaine um, issues, uh, which we are facing, all of us that have adult congenital programs and see adult congenital patients, uh, are dealing with uh, the reality that the Fontaine operation can be a great palliation, but in the long run, we face so many issues. And eventually, many of us are facing the necessity to consider transplantation or mechanical support. And in reality, multi-organ transplantation. So uh, that's why we are here today. And what um, you will see if you look at the program that's available is um, this is an incremental program. We start the day by talking about uh, the aging Fontan patient, and we talk about some of our protocols, which in, in many ways reflect many of the protocols that exist around the country now for following uh, these Fontan survivors. And then we go on to the failing Fontan physiology, and in the afternoon, that's where the deep dive occurs into transplantation, and then eventually finishing up with heart and liver transplantation and um, the issues uh, related to that. Uh, we will have Dr. Glenn Van Arsdale, uh, the uh, chief of our congenital surgical uh, program here uh, at UCLA, give a keynote speech uh, in the afternoon, uh, late afternoon, to close out the session. Uh, so please uh, stick around for that. Uh, I would like to thank um, uh, those that gave us grants, uh, our industry partners, Bayless, uh, Medtronic, and Penumbra, as well as our exhibitors. Uh, they're listed there. Please uh, do take time at the breaks uh, to go and talk to the exhibitors and um, see how they are involved in uh, this field as well. Uh, but without uh, further ado, we would like to start uh, our program here, and we'll have Dr. Lurie and Dr. Lin moderate the first session, which is care for the stable Fontan patient. Welcome and thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here and being on time. We appreciate that. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Lee Reardon. Um, Dr. Reardon did his undergraduate um, degree at UC Santa Cruz as a banana slug. Um, he went to medical school at the Medical College of Virginia, did a med peds residency at Cedars sinai Medical Center, pediatric cardiology here at UCLA, and adult congenital heart disease here at UCLA. He's currently an assistant clinical professor in both medicine and pediatrics, where he wears a lot of different hats and has many different skills. He's the director of the Transitional Care Program for Young Adults with Congenital Heart Disease, director of the Pediatric Mechanical Circulatory Support Pro Program, and also um, one of my um, friends and colleagues in the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center. So please give Dr. Reardon a warm welcome. Ah, oh, thanks, Jeanette. Um, so as the pediatric cardiologist in our adult congenital group, I was sort of charged with uh, talking about the Fontan from birth until um, teenage years. And just to give some of the people in the room who take care of our, our, our Fontans, particularly when they come in after a transplant, um, and to sort of see the road that they've taken um, in order to get there. And, um, you know, it's a really beautiful, elegant operation, but uh, as Jamil was mentioning, there are certainly some complications that come along with this type of physiology. Um, you know, I find the Fontan super special to me because I actually, when I was considering medicine as a career, met a woman in an EMT class whose daughter was having a Fontan, and her sort of experience and talking to me about um, her daughter growing up um, over the years was one thing that really inspired me to actually sort of change a career from being a speechwriter to being a physician. Um, and so I, I kind of am sad that I lost touch with them. Um, I kind of wonder, this, she, this was 1995, so um, Jenny would be in her 20s and 30s now, and it'd be really interesting to see how she's doing. So I have no disclosures um, for my talk. 
And um, as most people in this room are well aware, the, the, the number of patients with uh, adult congenital heart disease is really skyrocketed over the years. And that is really because of the success of the procedures that we've been able to offer our patients. Um, currently, we estimate that there are about 1.5 million patients in uh, the United States with uh, complex congenital or with congenital heart disease, and about a third of those have complex lesions um, such as the Fontan. Now, we really build upon um, the pioneers of our field, and you know the the BT shunt was first done performed in 1944 on a patient with uh, tetralogy of Fallot who was cyanotic. Um, and uh, this experimental shunt really was the forefront and pushed us to be able to offer some of the palliations for uh, patients with single ventricles. So this is just a, a, a picture of that original surgery in 1944 that over time um, led to a variety of other palliations and types of shunts that were, were able to address the cyanotic uh, newborn. Now. Um, we often talk about these patients as having single ventricle physiology or being single ventricles, and there's very few true single ventricles, and you can see there on the left, um, the double inlet left ventricle is uh, really a true single ventricle, but then we talk about other types of single ventricles as being single ventricle physiology. So this includes things like tricuspid atresia, tricuspid atresia with uh, transposed great arteries, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and then things where there's insufficient um, development of uh, two ventricles to, to be able to survive into a two ventricle physiology. So um, a beautiful illustration by my colleague, Dr. Abelholson, shows some of the evolution of some of the shunts that uh, were able to be employed to address some of these lesions, including um, central shunts off of um, uh, the aorta, as well as a, the BT shunt that I mentioned earlier before that was first performed in, in 1944. And then the Glenn shunt, which is pumping the SVC into the pulmonary artery right there. Now, the goal in these cases has been to take a blue baby and make them pink. And as I was looking through um, Google, I found uh, the Hatch Baby Project, which is an interesting um, uh, art, art exhibition that started in, um, in Europe. And there's a bunch of these blue babies that are supposed to symbolize the fear and trepidation that parents um, uh, experience as they become new parents. But I thought it was kind of an interesting art exhibit. And this one is currently in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is the sister city of a German city. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that they were quite certain what to do with the, the art exhibit. Um, so the Fontan procedure was first described by Fontan and Baudet in 1971 and has gone through um, a series of, of evolutions in order to reduce the complications and improve the hemodynamics of the Fontan. Um, and classically, um, in, 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 the, in the 70s, this was done on older children and went straight to a Fontan without sort of um, uh, interval procedures, but over time, um, currently, we often will do first a, a Glenn procedure, which uh, again takes the SVC and pumps it into the pulmonary artery, and then move on to a Fontan. And the Fontan really type that you receive really depended on the era that you had your surgery. So the classic Fontan, which is called the RAPA Fontan, really um, was employed mostly between 1971 and 1988, and then it was uh, modified into the lateral tunnel Fontan with a plus minus a fenestration um, and has really been used since the 1980s to present. And then in the 1990s, uh, we saw the development of the extra cardiac Fontan, which is usually most employed by most centers at this time, which was really the 1990s, which uses a Gore-Tex conduit. Um, and the hope with all of these different iterations of the Fontan was to reduce the atrial tissue that was being utilized for the Fontan development and therefore reduce the frequency of arrhythmias and hopefully also improve the hemodynamics. But despite this, um, this, this doesn't sort of prevent the, the, the essential problem that there is an absence of a pump that takes blood from the venous system and pumps it into the pulmonary circuit. And this really has a long-term consequence that elevates venous pressure and um, produces low cardiac output. And the resultant issue is that all the organs um, downstream from uh, the, the venous system tend to have problems resulting in liver problems and congestion, arrhythmias, heart failure, renal failure, and um, protein-losing enteropathy and, and other types of long-term consequences. 
And the problems that Fontan's face or patients with Fontan's face are, are really um, uh, variable and extensive, and they, they, ex they range from arrhythmias, both atrial arrhythmias are, are the primary things that we deal with, but Dr. Moore and Dr. Shannon will address some of the issues um, that we face with our patients that often require pacing um, and also the sudden death, death risk. Um, patients, because of this Fontan palliation, often will develop systolic or diastolic failure. And then um, the diseases of adulthood, such as systemic hypertension, can cause further failure of the, the, the systemic ventricle. We have diabetes, thyroid disease, and hyperlipidemia that also um, play into part. Patients often have um, pulmonary disease with restri restrictive physiology because of multiple sternotomies and, um, and, and the issues that come along with that. And then we also have the adult issues of some of the patients that choose to um, have to smoke, um, for example. Also, the low flow phenomenon of the uh, Fontan can put patients at risk for thromboembolism of the Fontan circuit. And then, of course, our patients who, once they reach adulthood, often want to have normal lives, including um, uh, engaging in reproduction, um, which can be um, problematic for a lot of our patients. Now, this is a um, publication from Paul Carey back in 2008, which really um, was such a seminal paper looking at the survival of all patients um, who've had a Fontan according to the type of Fontan that, that um, uh, was employed at the time of their surgery. And really, there's a, you can see in the first graph that there's a significant or mortality associated with the initiation of the actual Fontan circuit. But if you survive the periop period, then your survival is improved. But as you can see, as you get to the 25 years out from the Fontan, you have significant mortality. And the number one cause of death in, in, heart, in ACHD is heart failure. You can see throughout this um, uh, chart that the more peach-colored section are deaths from heart failure in various types of congenital heart disease. And um, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the univentricular heart, are sort of circled there for you to see. So today's strategy really is to focus on um, how do we manage the patient from um, pediatrics through adulthood, and try and uh, sustain them with um, the best physiology possible. And then as we see complications, how and when to intervene in ways that are most appropriate. So thank you so much for um, joining us today. Just a little plug for Camp Del Corazon and the PACE program. So a lot of the patients in these pictures have Fontans. And it is a um, delightful program of patients who are eight, 18 to 27. And the program focuses on taking charge of your health, being aware of your prognosis and the types of bridges you may have to cross in the future. And this was an art project that was done a couple of years ago at Pace, and normal hearts are boring. Thanks so much. <laughs>